Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the 30th session of Lums Live. If you've missed out on any of our previous sessions, they're on YouTube, they're also on Facebook, look them up. And we've had some fantastic conversations. None more fantastic than the one that we are going to have today. We're very proud and honored to have a tremendous uh, group of people who are here. They've taken our time, we're indebted to them. Um, our first panelist, um, one could say a lot of things about her, the youngest Nobel Peace Prize winner, an Oxford graduate, an activist, but I think one line would suffice. She's someone who from a tender age fought, fought for young girls' education. She fell, she stood up again and continued fighting. And today she stands much, much taller. We're proud and honored to have with us today our very own Malala Yousafzai. Malala, very warm welcome and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Adil. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Uh, our next panelist, she works very closely with Malala. She's an international expert in program design and performance, learning and accountability. She has a focus on women and girls empowerment. She's also the chief programs officer at Malala Fund. Dr. Maliha Khan also joins us, joins us from London. Dr. Maliha, thank you for your time and a very warm welcome. Thank you so much, Adil. Our third panelist, usually he feels very embarrassed when one gives a detailed uh, introduction and I will not do that. I will save him the embarrassment. Um, he's an entrepreneur, he's a philanthropist, he's a visionary, but here's one sentence about him. There are very few people that the society is indebted to, and we are indebted to him and for all his endeavors. We are proud and honored to have with us today, Sayyid Babar Ali Saab. Babar Saab, thank you for your time today, sir. Thank you. And, and last but not least, someone who has a very tough job these days. Uh, he faces a lot of criticism. He faces a lot of tough questions. He has to take tough decisions, and he's always there without batting an eyelid. And he takes out time for us. Uh, we're honored again to have the Vice Chancellor of Lums of Dr. Arshad Ahmed. Dr. Saab, thank you again for your time, as always. Thank Malala, you, I have, Malala, I have, a lots, I have lots of questions for you from Lums students, but I'm going to do a little bit of indulgence. Here's, the, here's my question. Apna gaon, apna ghar, apna shahar, apna vatan, yaad aata hai aapko? Uh, pehle, Adil, aapka shukriya. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really honored to have this opportunity. And, uh, uh, you know, I have, I've been a big fan of yours because I, you know, I always loved watching uh, you on, in, you know, in TV ads and different shows. And uh, you are coming from an amazing family. And I had the honor to meet your mother. Um, and uh, it, it's just an honor to, to speak to you today. Ghar um, hamesha yaad aata hai. I miss my home all the time. And uh, in the past uh, six, seven years, we always felt that there was something missing in our life. We had not seen Pakistan for almost five and a half years. And I was able to, uh, you know, to come to Pakistan in 2018. And I just felt a sense of completion. It's hard to express it in words, uh, but meeting my uh, family members, my friends, uh, seeing my home again, it was I cannot express that joy and pleasure that I saw on that day. Uh, and I was just immensely grateful that I got the opportunity to see my home and my friends. And I hope that I can visit Pakistan uh, again and again and come back to my home country. It's, I, you know, I, I belong there. That's where, that's where I'm from. And, um, and that's where I want to continue my work and, 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 and live there. We hope and we pray that you come here and you work here because there's a key word that you used, home and belongingness. There's a tremendous, tremendous word. Uh, Dr. Maliha, Malala Fund, there's been much talk about, about the Malala Fund. Please tell us, what does it do? How transparent it is? What are the objectives? Very briefly, give us a little overview of Malala Fund. Uh, thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, so we're very honored. Malala Fund was founded by Malala uh, and her father, uh, Ziauddin, uh, in, in 2013 um, as a foundation to do their work uh, for what they wanted to carry out in terms of girls' education. So what does Malala Fund do? Very, very simply, it advocates for 12 years of free, safe and quality education for every girl in the world. Um, we currently work in eight countries, um, including Pakistan. Pakistan was actually our first country, the first country we made grants in, and the country we have the biggest investments in to date 
Um, and as the head of programs in, uh, uh, for Malala Fund, it's also the country I visit the most <laughs> and put the most efforts into uh, being Pakistani myself. Um, so we, what we do is we fund uh, people who are working on the ground uh, on different aspects of girls' education. We give them grants, we build their capacity, we elevate their voice, give them a bigger platform. Malala is very dedicated and her father are very dedicated to, to amplifying what these activists are saying on the ground in terms of how do you give girls a better quality education. And we, like I said, we do that in eight countries and, and we certainly uh, hope to continue to do that in Pakistan. Uh, Babar Saab, I want to ask you, you know, you've been a visionary, especially regarding education. You know, there was 40 years ago, almost 40 years ago, that you envisioned LUMS and then look where it is today and hopefully it will continue to grow. My question to you would be, there are still huge gaps uh, in Pakistan education system. How do you fill those gaps? Is it our job? Is it the job of the private sector and people and activists? Or is it the government's job? When will this, when will this gap of education end? You know, it's, it's a collective effort. It's, uh, I think, the primary responsibilities of government because, uh, uh, you know, the government has uh, their writ all over the country. And uh, uh, it's, uh, I mean, every country that has progressed uh, in this world have uh, the government have taken this as their primary responsibility. Unfortunately, in Pakistan, uh, education has been on the back burner right from the word go. Uh, they had limited resources. I mean, the, the, the budget of, uh, for allocated to education is perhaps one of the lowest in the world uh, against the GDP. And they always select the, the weakest minister to be the minister of education. So this is uh, something which... Uh, has been neglected throughout Pakistan's unfortunate history. And uh, that's why the private sector today at all levels, including private, primary and secondary and tertiary, private sector have started to move in. But there are very few exceptions where people have moved in on the basis of doing something for society. The people, majority of uh, or 90 percent of the effort in the private sector is for making money at, at the primary level even in villages people are are running schools not to give education but to make money because people uh, even the poorest uneducated person has realized that the only way that their children can progress in life is education and they are being shortchanged right and left by everybody in villages in schools in mahallas in streets and uh, so this is a it's a it's a, it's an uphill task it's a, it's, a, it's a battle that has to be fought but ultimately the responsibilities of government they they have to allocate larger resources attract the best brains to education uh, for to enter at the education field as, as teachers and then work from there that is what is really needed well, we heard so much about this government, about education. None of that uh, we haven't seen much yet. Maybe we will in the future. Uh, Dr. Arshad, regarding LUMS, you know, LUMS boasts of being a torchbearer of education accessibility, education without borders. Um, and then the program, the National Outreach Program, is an example of that. So tell us very briefly, what is the National Outreach Program, A, and B, what impact has this approach had on the evolution of LUMS over the years? Thank you, uh, Adil, and uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Um, a very uh, warm welcome to our uh, special guest, Malala. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, Dr. Baliha, uh, Baba Saab, everyone, really a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, you know, I grew up in Karachi um, back in, uh, <laughs> I, I guess we're all young here today with Baba Saab. Uh, he he tells us to learn uh, every day, and we all feel young as a result of it. Uh, but going back, uh, when I grew up in Karachi, uh, the diversity spoke to uh, a kind of accessibility and inclusiveness that I think still is, is a source of strength uh, for uh, the country. And then when I moved to Canada back in 76, uh, you know, um, the model here was one of a mosaic where you have people from all over the world. And, you know, that's the metaphor that makes, it's quite different from south of the border where, 
we see it's more of a melting pot uh, kind of an idea. And so when we think of an educational institution like LUMS, uh, it really is a, a mosaic. And we go back 20 years, you asked about the NOP program, the National Outreach Program. This is a program where one out, one out of 10 students uh, are drawn from almost all parts of the country, mostly from Punjab. But also, I can tell you that uh, the second uh, biggest area where we have NOP students come from Khyber, Pakhtunistan, and then Sindh, and then Azad Kashmir, then Gilgit Baltistan, and, and of course, Balochistan. So every 160, in fact, uh, towns, villages, and cities is where we draw our strength from. And it is in this uh, diversity, this richness of uh, making uh, education accessible where one out, one out of our 10 students are coming from these places. But I think equally important, an extension of the NOP, which many universities have emulated, is um, <clears throat> the idea of supporting students so they have access to education in the best ways that is provided by either private or public universities. And so uh, one out of 10 students are NOP, but one out of three students at LUMS uh, have this support. So now bringing people in is step one, but the step two and step three are perhaps even more important is once the students come in, how do they get enculturated in uh, uh, you know, teaching, learning and their own personal development? So that's a big question that uh, we have been learning and, and trying to uh, calibrate over the years. We're very proud of uh, some of the achievements of these students who go on to get scholarships and a quarter of them actually uh, go on to do higher education. Um, but then we also have the third part, which is uh, really about uh, how we learn from them. Uh, so, you know, the idea is uh, that the strength of diversity is really not that you help people, but actually you know, everybody is better off. So that's the LUMS model. And I think as much as uh, other universities uh, have tried to do part one, it's the part two and part three, which really matters is what do you do when you're together and what do you do as a result of your learning? How do you go and serve others as a result? Malala, we have a, a newspaper in Lums called Lums Post. So we advertise anybody who wants to ask anything can ask. So they through, gave, gave us many questions. So here's one question from a student and he or she, I don't know if, if uh, it's a boy or a girl, they want to know this from Malala. You're a role model for many young women across the world. Is there any woman in Pakistan or anywhere else that you all look up to? Someone who's that, that you think is a role model for you? Um, I must say there are many. Uh, when I was uh, growing up and I became uh, an advocate for girls' education at a very young <clears> age, <throat> I was only 10 or 11, and I used to see these amazing uh, women who were advocates for women's rights, for, um, <clears throat> for education, for equality, and they always inspired me uh, from... Samar Minalla, Tahira Abdullah, to Rakshanda Naz, to um, uh, Ed, uh, Asma Jangir Sahib at that time. And it was just incredible to see these women role models uh, who, have, who were very vocal about uh, you know, speaking out about women's rights and they truly inspired me. And there are many more, uh, I, may not be say, I may not be able to say every name, but I, I really admire them. One more question for you, which is someone wants to know that how has this college education transformed you comparing Malala who entered Oxford and the Malala who graduated? How are these two people different? Oh, they're very different, 100%. Uh, when I was going to Oxford, I was very shy and nervous. Uh, in my school, I was not able to make that many friends. I only had one or two friends. And uh, in school, I joined at a time when there were already sort of groups formed and you know, everybody would understand when you are only 15 or 16 and you're, you're joining a school and you have those sort of, sort of peer pressure on you. Uh, so, you know, I used to do all these serious things. I used to travel, write a book, make a film, and then I'll be in a classroom. Usually quite, you know, did not know what to say because I felt that I just could not really become part of that conversation and I, that I felt I was maybe too serious. Uh, but then I realized that, you know, I wanted my fun, my old part back. You know, I wanted to be that normal Malala that I was in Pakistan, you know, in a classroom uh, to be, uh, you know, someone of my, my own age. And uh, in university, I had decided that, um, you know, whatever happens, I will be making sure that I reach out, uh, you know, to friends that I 
you know, that I, I was prepared. I was nervous, but I went there prepared. And uh, in university, I, lit, I just sort of found myself uh, and that old self that, you know, was funny and wanted to enjoy time with friends and wanted to, you know, go for dinner with friends and sit in the gardens and joke about things and talk about, you know, Pakistani dramas or films. And um, that, that was, this was a, a fun part. And I uh, really enjoyed that uh, that time. And I also was really grateful that I made uh, some amazing friends in university. Well, make sure you continue to laugh and smile. That's very important. Uh, Dr. Malia, Daniel Harun is a student um, with the class of 2021, and he's asked you this question. He wants to know if you could make one change in Pakistan's education system, big or small, what would that be? And why would you make that change? Well, thank you for that one. And if you made me the emperor of all education in Pakistan, um, I would... Uh, hope to succeed Babar Ali because I'll build on what he said, which is the government needs to take responsibility. The government needs to invest the right funding and resources because, you know, private sector can't do it. It has to be the government. The government has to put the funds in. Once the funds have been put in, building from that, the one change I would make is make the system equitable. Right now, we have a very tiered system, uh, starting with the Whole, what's the medium of education? If Urdu medium, then it's not okay. If you teach everyone in English, if the kids don't understand the language, then what will they learn? So, you know, uh, with that, with uh, revising the curriculum to again make it approachable to the majority of the students, not the minority of the students, to put in issues of, of uh, empathy, equity, uh, diversity into the curriculum so our students you know, become good citizens uh, of, of, of Pakistan and, and, and the world um, and, and to really uh, start from there. Uh, I think if we can do that and slowly build on it, if, if, our, if we put in the right resources and we change the nature of the education we're providing, starting with the medium of instruction um, and the content of the curriculum, I think we could go a very, very long way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Babar Saab, two questions. When is the Urdu version of your book coming out? That's one. And the second is, uh, you know, you actually titled your book Learning from Others. So the young people who are watching, some of them are maybe full of hope, some of them maybe disillusioned, I don't know. What would you say to the young entrepreneur or the young people who are just starting out in today's Pakistan? What, what would you tell them? Well, as far as the first question is concerned, it's in the works and hopefully by the end of this year, it'll be printed. It's, um, it's being, I mean, it's been translated, but um, it's being looked at, it's been corrected. And uh, hopefully by the end of the year, the Urdu version will be out. Now, as far as the second question is concerned, it's, you know, there is no one answer to, to success in life. My one thing that I keep on stressing is, is work hard, be truthful. You know, stay on the straight paths. You can't go wrong. And uh, that is something that uh, I am continually sort of engaging our faculty at LUMS with is, you know, inculcate ethics into the student's DNA. So this is something that uh, I feel that the only way that we can, you know, somebody asked me what, what, what would you expect from a NAM student? So I would say, that again capsules everything that you have taught them of the value of, of ethics in life. And uh, I think that is something that the country needs very badly. If you see all the malady and you read the newspapers, your pilots going with false planks, this thing, your doctors having fake certificates. You know, nobody knows the amount of damage that the doctors have, dead, have done. They bury their mistakes and nobody knows about what they have done. So you really have to clean up the whole system and bring, it, bring them to, to truth in whatever they do. 
And I remember that very sad line in your book where you say that if your if your father was alive, he would see that there's a total breakdown of of values in the society. And that was such a sad line in your book, Babur Sahib. Um, uh, Dr. Arshad, is, is it true? Is is Lum's teaching what what Babur Sahib mentions it? And is it the job of a university, or should we start at school, character building, not lying, you know, just being truthful? So Islam is doing that. That's that's one. Secondly, you know, you talk about learning without borders and you know, and inclusiveness. So many students coming together. Why is that important? And what would that lead to? Why can't we have an elitist organization, elitist institution, and then the poor can study elsewhere? What's wrong with that? <laughs> well, I think uh, the part about elitism is mostly perception. because that is certainly not the reality at lums as i described earlier on you know it's a mosaic of uh, the country it's really a mini pakistan when you come and learn at lums and learn from each other but um, <clears throat> i think uh, the the questions you're asking about uh, 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 you, you know you, you you were asking earlier on about uh, inclusivity is that uh, is that the focus of the question or uh, help me again a right. two part question right. here correct a is lums teaching character that babar sahib right, mentions right. <clears throat> right right so uh, look uh, the character part the uh, developmental part obviously happens before you come to university and parents and your mahol aapka jo uh, uh, you, you know the people you look up to jinhone aap aap pe asar kiya hai un logon ke sath to It, it's a big deal and it happens they say before you are 3 years old i mean uh, these are things that begin right from the day you join uh, your, your family and uh, of course all the other institutions whether they are primary or secondary schools are extensions of that family and lums family is no different in that way uh, and you know what you learn at the end of the day it's not the subject matter is important obviously uh, concepts are important frameworks are important but your development it goes from say black and white when you are young to something more nuanced there's confusion that's part of the learning process you have to go through confusion and then you get these multiple relative points of view and a good education encourages that it it, it does encourage confusion and failure by the way those are also important uh, pathways towards development but at the end of the day you have to have a point of view you have to have some values which babar sahab was talking about so that you can be rooted as an individual as a thinking person who brings in a sense a sensibility and a disposition that has more to do with uh, listening more than sort of forcing your way through because the more we know uh, as the saying goes the less we know it uh, we can see uh, most of the uh, issues that we face including diversity and inclusiveness are uh, very very complicated and nuanced so uh, when you ask me about no borders the idea of no borders is not geography or uh, uh, discipline uh, uh, in the sense that uh, you know these these big questions we face require us to think like economists and politicians and uh, business people and lawyers and uh, uh, anthropologists for that matter uh, no borders is the idea that you uh can empathize from other viewpoints and then form your own opinion take a stand tell the truth as babar sahab has repeatedly mentioned uh and that truth must be one that is grounded in the values that you were raised in that mahol is could be your home your village but it could also be the country that you belong in and that is the collective strength that we can draw from our youth who by the way uh are probably the fifth youngest in the entire planet uh, we've got a lot to look forward to so the glass really is half full that in that sense uh, we have a lot lot uh, to build on in in terms of a uh, uh, young people who have shown resilience against all odds pehle uh, earthquakes the ab covid aa gaya hai but i think it's the youth who are going to show us the way forward uh, not those that have uh, boomers and and others can uh, uh, learn from our, our youth quite a bit Uh, the wonderful saying that dr arsha referred to some of you may be unaware of that this is how it goes uh, the le- the less we know the less we realize that the less we know but the more we know the more we realize that the less we know it's a fantastic saying 
uh, Malala, the students want to know the following things. How, how, do you, how did you feel when you were asked to be the keynote speaker um, for the LUMS class of 2020? What, what went through your mind? Uh, so first of all, I uh, had the honor to meet Sayyid Babar Ali Saab, um, you know, I think last year, and uh, I was truly inspired by his uh, powerful words, his encouraging words, and I have been a, become a fan of uh, Babar Ali Saab since then. And uh, when I heard about the invite, I said yes straight away. And initially, I was hoping to be in Pakistan and to deliver that speech in Lums. And uh, that did not happen, unfortunately, because of the COVID. Um, and uh, so, but still, I, you know, it was still equally uh, an honorable and, uh, you know, an, an important moment for me to do it, uh, you know, on my phone in my, in my house. And uh, I have, you know, LUMS is a prestigious institution. It has uh, produced incredible uh, thinkers and change makers. And, uh, you know, and, and it, it will continue producing that. And that's the vision that we have for Pakistan, that it has that thriving and, uh, you know, progressive youth. And I think LUMS is, is part of that, of that mission. It's, it's playing that role in it. So it was an honor to speak. Yes, Babar Saab does that. He's a very dangerous man. So, you know, don't interact with him too much. He's going to make you work really hard for this country. He's done it to a lot of people. So here's another question. That's from me. Do you get nervous when you're on a big platform, you know, people listening with telescopes and you're know, recording something and then, you know, you may face criticism. Um, some people idealize you. This, isn't there pressure? Uh, to be honest, yes, there is pressure. Uh, you have to think twice before you say anything. But, you know, when, when you are speaking the truth and when you believe in the message that you are delivering, there's nothing to be afraid of. When I go on a stage, I share my story. I talk about my passion for education. I say that education is equally important for every girl around the world and every girl deserves to have this right. And I think there's nothing to be afraid of when you say that. So as long as you're speaking the truth, I think, uh, you know, just don't worry about how you look and how you are saying it. And if you are mispronouncing it, I think these are just small things. Your message is, is the bigger uh, is, is your bigger is the bigger mission that you are carrying with you so that's you know focus on that um and yeah but so i i don't focus on the on the small things wow that's wonderful my family always grilled me for mispronouncing words so i wish i didn't have that pressure um dr malia uh, someone wants to know what are some milestones that malala fund has achieved so far which you can look back and be proud of and say okay good progress was was being made good progress has been made so tell us about those um yeah thanks thanks for that one i, I, meant, I mean one thing to remember is you know malala has just graduated from university so malala fund is even younger than she is <laughs> so we're a very 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 youthful organization we've only really been around since 2013 really only fully functioning since about 2015 um so in that short time though we're proud of many some some very big things that we've been able to do i won't talk about some of the global uh things that malala with her uh you know sort of stature and what she represents for girls education has been able to do in terms of speaking at the un on various things um getting uh the g7 to commit uh you know uh increase their funding for girls education around the world getting the japanese government to increase their funding uh, up by several billion uh dollars uh for girls education around the world what i think she and her father are proudest of and certainly what i am proudest of is are the things we've been able to do in pakistan and so since 2013 we've committed almost six and a half million dollars uh to funding in pakistan uh, we've uh, established a school uh, for girls in the home district uh, where Malala and Zeldin. I know I knew Malala wanted to mention it. I didn't know if she'd get the question, so I thought I'd throw it in. Uh, it's very, very proud of the of the school in Changla that they've been able to start, and we've been able to fund 14 different what we call champions of education in Pakistan. People who are who've started from the ground up, who are working on the ground, doing all sorts of amazing things, um, putting uh, freely available apps up that help students remediate their education, which have been 
you know, uh, we've really been able to increase the reach of that during COVID, which is so important and, and necessary when all the kids are out of school, to people who are advocating with the government to increase funding, change policies. Um, one of our new champions is working in Thar, uh, one of the most marginalized regions in Pakistan, to bring, uh, to increase girls' access to STEM education and general education in a, in a region like, like Thar, and they're working with groups of girls around that. So really proud of the group of, of champions we have in Pakistan and the work that we're able to do. We want to increase all of that, and we hope we will be able to. We've applied for registration. As soon as we get our registration, we're going to start an office in Pakistan and really hope to almost double our, our investment in the country over the next few years. If I could add, sorry. Yes, no, oh, I'm sorry. Go. go ahead. Uh, if I could add to that, uh, regarding our work in Pakistan, uh, I always wanted to start from my home village, Shangla. That's where my parents are from. And in Shangla, there wasn't any uh, secondary school for girls. And, you know, I have been, uh, I had been advocating for girls education and the, the support that I was receiving globally. And then I received a Nobel Peace Prize. So uh, soon after that, I dedicated that money to starting a school in Shangla. And it became sort of the first secondary school for girls in that village. And uh, everybody, you know, is so excited. It has given hope to so many young girls. Uh, and even I heard that when it was their vacation time in the summer, many of the girls did not want to leave school. They were like, just keep it going. We don't want to go back home because we enjoy this, this opportunity of learning. We, would, we just want to read, write, color. And, and it was it was an empowering moment for those young girls. And we want we hope that, you know, the school grows and it can educate the bright uh, and incredible girls of Shangla uh, and it can completely change that village. And uh, so this is sort of one big uh, sort of project that we have done uh, in Shangla. But the rest of our focus is on uh, supporting advocates who work for girls education. And it's again connected to uh, our, you know, my story and my father's story, because when we started speaking out in Swat Valley in the time of terrorism, uh, we were activists, we were advocates, and I recognize the importance of, uh, you know, even small support that these activists can get and, and how it, uh, you know, uh, how it empowers them to even uh, to, you know, expand their outreach to reach for, you know, far many students with that even little support. So that is the vision that we have to support activists who uh, were just like me and my dad and uh, uh, we are ensuring that we do it globally. Uh, and we also recognize that there is not one universal solution when, when it comes to solving the issue of uh, girls' education. Uh, it varies across region, it varies across communities, across villages. In some places, we have to work on challenging the social norms. In other places, we have to work on uh, the lack of facilities from female teachers to uh, lack of transport. Uh, and so, and in some areas, it's you know we need to keep on pushing for increasing uh, increase in financing for education. So it's very sort of a bottom up approach that we have, and for that reason, it's so important that we work with the people on the ground, support them, become their companions, become their friends, and and work together with them, providing them the training, funding, and all the support that they need. Well, keep going, keep going. Faisal ka misra hai, chale chalo ki wo manzil labi nahi aayi. To abhi manzil to bahut dur hai, abhi to ye safar hai. Babar sahab, Rafiq, Jan, Jibran, ek humare dost hai, unhone ek, aapke liye bhi, and then Dr. Arshad, maybe if you want to respond to that as well. He wants to know from Babar sahab, how can we make our educational institutions actual knowledge providing centers? Not just lumps. How can we how can we make them actual knowledge providing centers? What do we do? Teachers, money, building, case studies, how do we do that? How do we impart real knowledge? You know, the one initiative that we have taken at LUMS is we've started a graduate program uh, in, 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 in most of the schools. But I can talk about the School of Science and Engineering with, where I'm deeply involved that uh, in the in the graduate program, we have opened the door to, uh, to to students from all over the country and from all institutions who can make it on the basis of you know all admission at LUMS is on merit. And I'm very happy to tell you that two weeks ago we graduated twenty PhDs who came from other institutions. Not a single one grew out of lumps. They came from other institutions from all over the country. 
And this is, I think, uh, a new uh, initiative that we have taken is to provide opportunities to people who could not get into the undergraduate program at LUMS. And if they are good enough to come into the graduate program, they, we would welcome them, we support them, we finance them. And to have 20 PhDs of international standard coming out of the School of Science and Engineering, I think is something which gives us a lot of satisfaction and, 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 and happiness. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Achad, if you want to add to that, but I also have a question for you in addition to that. Uh, you okay. know, like Papa Saab mentioned, you know, LUMS continuously widens its, its scope. And somebody asked once uh, Barber Saab to open LUMS in Karachi, and I think he refused. He said, no, we have one center of excellence and we'll just focus on, on that. So there's this School of Education and then there's LUMS Learning Institute. You know, there's just two examples where expansion is happening. So why, why do we need to have new initiatives why do we need to do that well i think it ties into the other no borders uh, question you were asking earlier on where you know a school represents a collection of knowledge to your question about what knowledge do we impart uh, but then the the issues society faces are multidisciplinary and they in, in invoke many different points of view and different uh, schools of thought and so uh, when we've had this expansion with uh, law and with uh, 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 science and engineering, Babasab talked about the oldest school, of course, is the business school. And the biggest school we have is the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. When you put all of this together, you get a comprehensive education. And so the idea is for students to, is to traverse all of these disciplines and get a taste of uh, what it is that these thinkers are bringing to the table. But it's not... I think the fundamental part about your question is what are we really doing at this university or institutions like ours is, is not so much to give something away. It's not like you open someone's head and fill it in with here's a bit of this and here's a bit of that and good luck to you. It's actually to form um, a, a bond and a partnership and, and uh, uh, an ecosystem where people uh, are beginning to uh, enculturate themselves as adults, young adults, who are going to be dealing on the ground with real issues, not just academic ones. So we have experiential components in our education. School of Education is a great example where we have a small graduate, relatively small graduate program. It's only a year old, this school. But then the, the graduating class, the first graduating class this June is, is going out there and back to their villages, back to their towns, back to their uh, 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 areas to have this forced multiplier effect. So that, you know, they, what they take, they give back, but they're giving back throughout the space. So I think uh, the, the biggest point, if I, if I can emphasize it is that 21st learning is not about just the teacher who gives knowledge to the student. It's a partnership where the student is deeply engaged in the academic em enterprise as the researcher as a designer and, and uh, as a, a, a presenter, uh, you know? So these are some of the aspects in which uh, individuals grow and universities are a natural place for this development to happen. Uh, and that's really important. Malala, we have a question for Nabila Abbas. I know you touched upon it, but Nabila will be very happy if I ask this question again, and if you want to add to it. And she asked, I really wanted to know what initiatives practically Malala Fund is going to implement in Pakistan regarding the education for the underprivileged. Any projects on that, if you want to answer that? And then I also have a question. So when we started working in Pakistan, we started from KP and now we have moved on to focusing on uh, South Punjab and then the rural part of Sindh. So we always start from the most marginalized parts. Uh, even in other countries, for instance, in Nigeria, we, we work in the Northern parts of Nigeria. Um, and in India, we work in Bihar and sort of the northern states where there's a huge um, sort of gender disparity when it comes to in, uh, lack of uh, facilities for education. And uh, so we always want to focus on, uh, on, on areas where uh, there's lack of support, lack of funding and where our help is needed. Um, it, you know, and I think that's sort of that's the strategy that we uh, that we use. And um, as Maliha mentioned, the project that we are supporting in Thar, and there are many other projects uh, 
which are supporting the most marginalized girls who otherwise would not have the opportunity to be in schools. Uh, and, um, um, you know, and but we also want to support uh, activists who are sort of thinking about using technology, who are using, you know, more innovative ways to reach out to, um, you know, uh, the most marginalized and as many students as possible. And right now, we are, but we are also very open to change. And we are also, uh, you know, because we want to work together with people, we don't want to be one of those sort of bureaucratic, I don't know what's the right word to use, institutions that does not accept change outside. So due to the COVID crisis, there are, I think right now, more than 40 million children in Pakistan who uh, do not have access to education. They're out of their schools. And in response to that, we have supported, uh, you know, all our champions who reached out to us and uh, and wanted to change their project slightly. And one of the that is uh, one of those is Harun. Uh, he works in Pakistan and he uses this digital uh, platform Talimabad, and he has reached to more than two million children in just a month. So we were able to, you know, work on that project, support him within a month, and uh, so we are very aware of what's happening. And uh, due to like the, the COVID. Uh, you know, pandemic, things have changed around that. And we have been very helpful and, and we have been very supportive of all of our champions if they wanted to change their projects slightly, if they wanted to, if their expenses increased slightly because of what's happening. So, um, uh, you know, our, our support is always there and, and we, we want to work together because I, I do not know all the answers, nor does Malala Fund know. We, you know, we look for expertise, we look for, we do research, we work together with with these activists and we try to find um, you know, tangible solutions and we want to ensure that resources are allocated to areas where they're needed the most. And one quick question again, someone wants to know in these last four years, what are your key lessons that you've learned? <laughs> in, I don't know, in what ways? I have learned a lot of lessons <laughs> uh, and I'm still learning. Um, regarding the work that we're doing for uh, girls education, again, I think adopting a bottom-up approach, but also, you know, I also do advocacy globally. I push for 12 years of education, you know, where it, whether it's at the UN or G7 or G20 and other platforms, we have to remember that these are some key platforms where global leaders are making decisions about where they want to allocate all this, all these resources to, all this money to. And it is important that we push for girls' education. It's, you know, if you don't push for it, they will ignore it. If you don't push for it, they will not focus on it. So we have been pushing for girls education and then especially secondary girls education because oftentimes countries will focus on primary but they do not invest enough in the secondary education of girls. And that is a crucial point because that's when girls drop out the most out of school, either because of social norms, because they get forced into early child marriages or they have to help their families financially. So these are some of the pressures that girls face. Um, so, you know, this has been one of my learnings is to keep a balance between working locally, nationally, and then on these international platforms. Um, another, well, I have been, I've been learning each and every day, uh, to be honest, there are, if, you know, um, if, if it comes to me personally, uh, I have learned a lot from my friends at university, you know, in my, uh, my from my friends at school, and uh, they have just taught me a lot. And uh, one thing that I have learned from my father is, is listening um, and he, when I was very little and even now, like when a little kid who's six or seven wants to say something, my father will pause and listen to that child. Sometimes like I will ignore my brothers. I'll be like, just keep on going. I'm not listening to you. But like his, his approach is that you have to listen to children. You have to listen to people, hear their views carefully, learn from them, talk to them, answer their questions, you know, ask them questions. And I think that's an important thing that we all need to do, uh, you know, listen to each other, hear each other's thoughts and be more open, be more, uh, be more tolerant about hearing different opinions. Uh, so, you know, there, there's, there's so much to learn and I keep on learning. Wow, yeah, we, we need to learn to listen as a nation. We don't listen, we react very quickly. Uh, but Dr. Malia, in the last three, four months, the world has changed. Uh, uh, you know, corporate sectors have gone down. And of course, philanthropy has gone down because of the economic crash. How has that affected Malala Fund? And what, what ideas or projects uh, do you have in the pipeline post-COVID? 
Yes, yeah, so we are operating under the under the, the assumption that the world is never going to go back to what it was before. And in many ways, that's that's very tragic and that's very sad because so many people have lost so much and continue, continue to lose so much. But in many ways, that's also, for me at least, slightly optimistic because I think the biggest changes happen when the world is under the most dramatic of shifts. You know, this is where you get disruptions and then people's minds get open to maybe doing things so differently because their own world has been disrupted. So they don't, they're not hanging on to the same things. So we are at Malala Fund trying to take advantage of that and trying to see what can we do to not only support, uh, you know, people who are working on the issue of girls' education around the world, uh, but how can we really take this opportunity to, to change and disrupt things? So one example I'll give is, um, I think Pakistan has one of the biggest digital divides in the world. The difference between a woman's access to digital technology and a man's access is some of the highest, right? So uh, a, a man is, uh, you know, a woman is, is, is less than 30% likely as a man to have access to a smartphone or a feature phone or a, a laptop or a computer in Pakistan, it's huge. And that's much, much worse for adolescent girls. Our experience is that if a girl has a But we ignore the fact that this is also an access, and, you know, a source of huge information, connectivity, ability to, you know, get on apps, look at, uh, you know, do education, do banking, all sorts of things. Um, one of the things we're finding, though, the, the disruption of education is that parents are becoming slightly more open to girls also getting online, to girls accessing things through phones, etc. So we want to use this opportunity to really open it up and to use all sorts of multimedia, radio, um, apps, podcasts, and other things to really drive home this message of one, providing girls with this alternative education, but also sensitizing parents and teachers and our parents say that gatekeeper because our many young people who are in every thing to sensitizing them that, you know, it's, it's very, very important that girls have the same access to opportunities as boys do and how can we provide that, particularly at that sensitive adolescent age, as Malala so eloquently put it, which is when, when, when we really start to clamp down on them. So we have lots of plans for doing uh, work in the COVID area around the world, but particularly for Pakistan, um, we'll be giving, we'll be starting to implement though, we, we've already implemented several grants, but we'll be issuing a few more out now very, very soon. And we hope to continue to work in this context, uh, trying to address it as much as possible. And if I could Barbara, sorry. add, sorry. Sorry, Malal, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think if I could add, I think one of the biggest challenges post COVID would be financing for education. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, like uh, this has been a challenging time for corporates, for governments, and uh, they will be, you know, they might become a bit more stingy in funding towards education and other uh, areas of, for instance, health and environment. So it's important that uh, we keep on pushing for investment in girls' education uh, and. Uh, so I think Pakistan would need around like, you know, six trillion rupees in order to ensure that uh, all girls can go to school in the next 10 years. Uh, so there's a lot that needs to be done. We need to increase uh, financing for, for girls' education in Pakistan. Um, and um, so, I, you know, that, that's one of the, the, the key things um, that, that we need to do. Um, Adil, I'd like to ask a question uh, uh, to Malala. Malala, you know, I'm so thrilled by the good work that you're doing. Tell me, uh, in the developing world, uh, is there any country that you would single out uh, who, who've done extremely well in educating their, their women in the developing world? Um, to be honest, uh, I, I do not have enough information on that. Um, and uh, looking at the, you know, how countries are doing, uh, in most developing countries, uh, in, there is lack of investment in education, while in some countries we do not see this gender disparity as much. Like for instance, in Brazil, there are more boys out of school compared to girls. So, but you know, but still there are other challenges that are more specific to girls' education. I think maybe Maliha can say more uh, on that, but 
Um, I think often we hear the examples of Uganda as well, but um, Maliha can say more about that. Sure, I, th I think one of the countries we should really look at um, that's very close to home too is Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has done tremendously well in its investments in education overall, but also in, in female education. And they did that from, from the start. Um, and I think there is a case where you can see the investments in the social sector, particularly around, uh, around education, that's sort of bearing fruit. They've had other problems, uh, particularly economic and, and political and, and uh, with the militarization. But uh, otherwise, I think Sri Lanka is a really good example where they have made, made great inroads. Another one from a very low starting point is Bangladesh. It's actually done tremendously well from where they started to where they are now um, and their ability and, and their sort of, you know, the, the, and you can see the implications of that in terms of their other social, um, you know, sector uh, indicators like uh, child mortality, infant mortality, maternal mortality, and all of that. Once you start investing in education and, and social sector, all of those other things also start to follow suit. They again have a very, very long way to go, but in that regard, I think they've, they've done quite well. Thank we you. have a very interesting question. Uh, it's actually about Malala Fund, but it has two parts. I'm going to throw it at Babar Saab first, and then maybe Dr. Ashit, and then to the women. So someone wants to know, it, it's important to empower girls, and that's fine. We all understand that. However, it is equally important to prepare men to deal with such empowered women. Is LUMS doing anything about that? How do we, how do we train men who deal with empowered women? Babar Saab, you and then Dr. Ashit, uh, if you want to respond to that. You know, this is, uh, I think with 90% of the students that enter the undergraduate program at LUMS, this is the first time that they have, they have, they have experiencing um, co-education. And it's remarkable that they are able to adjust their, um, uh, their attitude towards each other in, 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 in a very short time. Uh, we do not have, in the classroom where they're sitting, there is, no, no segregation there. I mean, boys are sitting next to the girls and all that. So, and in the in the cafeteria and all that. So it's a, it's remarkable how quickly the boys adapt. I mean, yeah, I think it, the, the bigger challenge is to the boys how they behave with the girls rather than the other way around because the girls can gang up together to defend themselves, and the boys are more individualistic. And uh, so I think uh, that from that point of view. LAMS has brought in a, a good um, learning, uh, you know, experience for boys who have been brought up in an isolated environment. Uh, Dr. Archer, same question, and I can throw another question at you, uh, uh, which is, you know, you talk about inclusivity and, and you know, uh, students coming from all over Pakistan, all the provinces. Um, and there's a, there's a key word that we keep hearing these days, which is equity. Now, when I was younger, we would talk about being equal or equality. Now it's equity. I don't know what equity means. So is, is equity actually there in LUMS? Can you give us examples of that? Sure, I can. Um, let me go back to the uh, thread, uh, very nice thread and the question that came to in terms of, uh, you know, what's visible uh, at LUMS when it comes to gender related issues. So uh, uh, here I can give some very specific examples. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, we look at a business school, business in general dominated by men. Uh, uh, so one of the things we've done, I think we are probably the only school uh, in Pakistan, if not in, in the world, where all our graduate programs offer a 50% scholarship to women. And since we've done that, the numbers have just skyrocketed. So first of all, you've got to get them in, right? Um, and, and that uh, redress that imbalance. Uh, but then you can look at specific things like leadership. I mean, when you are going to talk constantly that uh, need to empower women, break the glass ceiling and do all of that, you have to also walk the talk. So our, uh, our most recent appointment, this is the most senior chief academic officer at LUMS is going to be a woman, um, is a woman, <laughs> just uh, has passed. I mean, this is a huge signal, not only as a role model, but deservedly so. Uh, I mean, you asked about COVID, uh, examples of COVID and women. Um, I think there was a Google survey recent, not Google, uh, Facebook uh, survey recently, where if you look at the countries that have responded the best to COVID, 
this is a countrywide phenomenon of leadership. It's been women leaders who've really uh, uh, successfully been able to navigate a question that nobody has an answer to. I mean, we still don't know how to deal with COVID, but some countries are doing better than others. And women leadership is a variable that makes a difference. We, we should be learning from that. But then you can go to the little details that affect student lives. You know, all of our washrooms and uh, public spaces are period friendly now. And this is a huge thing. You don't see that in the West uh, as, a, you know, you'll see it at Lums. So you've got to walk the talk. Um, and at your second part question about inclusivity and, and uh, examples of that are equally important. So we have five offices, and I think this is as good as it gets anywhere in the world. Uh, Office of uh, 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 Inclusivity and Accessibility, uh, that's the hub. We have an office of wellness. We have an office of counseling. We have an office of advising. We have an office of uh, uh, student affairs and, uh, and so on. And so what you see here is a first response to issues that are about inequity, that are about harassment, that are about uh, 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 gender uh, uh, you know, um, uh, pressures that you see around the campus. And these are the day-to-day -day things that students have to uh, enculturate themselves in understanding that, you know, the world that they came from and the world that they are going to, there is a transition and transformation that all of us have a right to have. Education is a right. It's, it's not a privilege. It's a right. And uh, every university in Pakistan should think about accessibility first to ensure everyone has that right to make this transition to develop as individuals so we can serve our country and so we can serve our regions, so we can serve the world. Malala, you want to be the first woman vice chancellor of LUMS? <laughs> uh, would love to be. Uh, I think, um, you know, regarding, you know, how, what, what, what the empowerment of women uh, means for men. And oftentimes there is this feeling of insecurity. There is a sense of threat, a sense of, uh, you know, insecurity there. And what I would say to all the men is that, you know, right now your country is walking with one foot. And if the other foot joins the walk, the walk becomes easier. So when women get empowered, when they uh, have equal opportunities and, and, you know, and more space in all these different sectors from politics to education, to sciences, uh, they help the country, uh, you know, uh, improve, develop more. Uh, they help the country progress. So it is take it as a as a as a benefit, as a good news. Uh, and uh, women love uh, working in collaboration. They're very, uh, you know, it it is known as uh, uh, you know as we see currently as with women leaders, they are uh, amazing at how they are responding to to the COVID. Uh, so. You know, the, it's, it's only a good news when we hear about the empowerment of women. We have time for one quick round of questions. And Sara Jahan has a question for Malala. And Sara Jahan wants to know, how have your own undergraduate studies broadened your understanding of development? Has it? Has it or was it just a degree, a piece of paper? Has it broadened <laughs> your, your vision or was it just an expensive piece of paper? Uh, it was expensive, I must say. Uh, but it was also... a uh, an incredible opportunity of learning. Uh, I learned from what was there uh, on the reading list in the textbooks, uh, but I also learned from what was not there and what we were not taught uh, and how limited oftentimes the reading list is. You know, all the authors could be men uh, and nobody is, you know, if you're learning about South Asia, uh, how limited the authors are and how it's one or two it's one or two names that you hear and you know oftentimes there are not that many names of women so you just learn how um, you know how much needs to be done and how much needs to be improved but along with that I think it developed the skills of independent learning for me uh, the whole point of Oxford learning is you know you get a reading list you get a question and then you are off to produce an essay within a week sometimes two essays within a week and then you have a tutorial you sit with your tutor and talk about the topic you question they question you so it is, it, is very, it is a very small group tutorial system. Uh, and uh, what you learn is you know, how to manage your time, how to do these researches, what, how to do the readings and sort of um, 
sort of skim through it and pick the important points. So we develop all these skills uh, within three years. And, uh, and I loved it. I really enjoyed it. And studying in Oxford in itself is such a beautiful experience. You are surrounded by these um, old, beautiful colleges. You sit in these amazing um, libraries and these old libraries and beautiful gardens. So I love that experience as well. Yeah, the Britishers were quite serious about education. Apart from Lums, you know, when we look at Lahore, we look at the Aitchison College, we look at Government College, we look at King Edward, all of them are made by the Britishers. So more on that. Dr. Maliha, last round of questions. Um, someone wants to know, what are the biggest hurdles in girls' education that, that Malala Fund or that you guys face? Thanks, Sudhir. Uh, and, I, and, and, and I'd be very remiss if I don't put a plug in for Kanaid also. Uh, that's, that's my... That's my uh, alma mater. So again, beautiful building. Um, the hurdles, I, I think the hurdles are many and most, some of them are, you, you know, it's the same for boys and girls, lack of access, lack of investment, uh, poor infrastructure, poor curriculum, but the ones that are specific for girls. Uh, so, so girls face all of those that the boys face, but then on top of it, there's the social, social norms um, uh, that, that really come into, into play. Uh, I think it's around the world, but particularly in Pakistan also. Um, basic education, primary education, tak to theek hai, bachi ko padha diya. Uske baad jab zara bade hoge, tab humare saare aa jate hain sawal. Lekin, lekin, lekin. Lekin school dur hai, lekin ladki ke liye theek nahi hai. Lekin raaste mein ladke tang karte hain, safe nahi hai. Whenever we start to bring these buts in, and it's okay for the boys, but it's not okay for the girls. That's where you know it's a social norm. Why is it not safe for a girl to travel a small distance, even a kilometer or a kilometer and a half to go to school? While it's safe for boys, what's this? What, what is that that coming in? Why don't we, you know, honor the sanctity of the girl who's going to school for an honorable thing and say, well, this is a good thing? And I think this is where you know these are the most these are where the barriers really start to come in where families, societies start to put pressures on girls. Um, this is also where girls start to feel like they can't learn. Then their attainment goes down. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. And so then, then you start to see this self-perpetuating cycle uh, where then girls start to drop out. So the biggest thing, the, the cliff that we look at is between the transition between uh, primary school and secondary school where girls are entering adolescence and that's where they're dropping off. That's why in, in Pakistan, you know, you only have four, four and a half, uh, five years of, of education uh, at, at the max for a lot of, uh, a lot of, a large segment of the population. And I think that's really important. One thing I wanted to add here, Adil, when we're talking about what do we do, what do men do with empowered women or how do we empower women? I think the question shouldn't be that, right? I think the question should be, when will we stop suppressing women? If we could just take all the energy we, we put into telling girls what they can't do, putting the barriers in place of them, or maybe you have a subservient jagai. Who peda oti is when son peda oti, uski up the hoi shat oti, sarakuch, hum upna sara zor lagada take you spo kistra se the bade, or usko upni jaga kistra se the kade. Agaram voi energy, if we put it towards just saying, you know, you're, you're, you are a human being and you have rights like every other human being, go forth and do what you want to do and what you can contribute to society, then I think that 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 to me is the key. Let's, let's just try that instead of thinking, oh, we have to do this for women. We have to do this for women. Let's just stop suppressing them and then see what happens. Babar Saab, Sadia Saleem Chima ne aapke liye ek sawal beja and she wants to know, where do you see Pakistan after a decade in context of women education? And how can we speed it up in addition to Malala's fund? Where, where do you see Pakistan's women education in, in a decade? Better, worse, same? I think it, 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 it has to improve. I mean, it's at the bottom of the, you know, it's uh, it's at the rock bottom, so it can't go any, you know, it can't be any worse. It has to improve, and I think with all the effort that is being generated now, and uh, I think Malala's effort and the effort that is being made by others, 
the, the, the women's education will improve, but we need more women activists. We need more women who will volunteer to um, hold hands of other you know, women to bring them up. I think peer pressure is very, also very important. Babar Sahib, I'm going to do a bit of indulgence. I have one more question for you, which is, what do you wish for, for this country? You've seen, you know, so much in your life. We've seen nothing. Um, uh, if you had a magic lamb, what would you fix? What would you change in this country today? I wish this country to be at peace with itself. <laughs> wow. Wow. Dr. Rasha, same question regarding lumps. Where do you see lumps in, in the days and months and, and years to come? And are we going there? Is, is the direction right? Yeah, I think um, nobody has a crystal ball, but certainly we have good intentions. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, whatever we've heard today, I think one of the takeaways for, for, for me, especially in the last part when uh, Dr. Maliha spoke and when Malala uh, uh, talked about, uh, uh, you know, moving forward, we, we, we need a different mindset, really. We can do this, we can do that, but it, we don't need a deficit model. We need something where we start with appreciation and uh, identify the strengths first, and then look at the gaps, and then, you know, uh, iterate towards the future. So this kind of uh, uh, inquiry, this is really a, a way of thinking really and a way of uh, looking ahead is uh, ask that, uh, be critical, but first start with some solid uh, um, appreciation of the good that we have. And when it comes to youth, if you, Malala talked about uh, of, um, 40 million young people who drop out very early and uh, don't have a chance to, uh, enjoy the privileges everyone else does, there are some 50 million who are in school, you know, um, and there are maybe 1.8 million teachers in the country, if you are generous in your math, math here. Um, and half of them are private, half of them are public, but most of the students are in the public sector. So we've been talking about system factors. We've been talking about everyone doing their part, and we're all privileged, especially at LUMS, to be able to uh, provide uh, the, uh, a more generous education, a more inclusive education, uh, where we learn to listen and say, we don't know, we don't have answers to everything. I think to admit that as Malala Sahiba did earlier on, and she was asked a question, she said, I don't know. Um, so I think that kind of humility, uh, the values-based education is going to uh, be with us much, much longer than some knowledge or some fact you have or some skill you've developed those are transient things, but the real thing is how we relate to each other as human beings. Uh, this is a universal phenomena and uh, women uh, should, we, we need to learn from them. That's the bottom line. I think history has taught us they are better teachers, they are better leaders. So let's get on with it. What are we waiting for? It has been a tremendous session. We're out of time. I'm going to do a bit of favoritism and I'm going to throw one more question at Malala. Somebody wants to know Malala, Tell us one thing about yourself that nobody knows. So some student wants to know that. What would that be? Uh, Let us in. Knows. Well, there might be quite a lot. Um, well, I am double jointed um, and I can bend my fingers backwards and it could, it could look creepy. So I'm not going to do it. Uh, and uh, I just, I, I'm right now, I'm just watching the Indian matchmaking and it's just insane, but I love it. And uh, I, you know, I sometimes watch Rick and Morty and just crazy shows as well. Uh, and uh, other than that, I love uh, playing, uh, you know, I love doing magic tricks. That's another of my interests that I love doing. And um, yeah, these are some of the few things that, that I love doing. But what I'll say, uh, you know, sort of my last final sort of comments is that, um, to all the young people in Pakistan, they must recognize that they are the future of Pakistan and they are the real change makers. Their input, their contribution, their support is very much needed. Uh, I know that they care about so many issues. They want to work on the environment in Pakistan. They want to make it a cleaner space. Uh, they want to ensure that everybody has equal opportunities. So it's important that 
uh, we go ahead with these missions with these um, uh, and 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 we go ahead with uh, you, you know we actually take action into this and i always tell young people that let your age not stop you from doing what you want um age is just a number i started speaking out when i was 11 and it was the support of my father and others who actually made me believe that it does not matter if i'm you know 14 years old and i'm talking to a president and prime minister it does not matter so you have to actually believe in uh, in your ideas and how you want to make that change and what your message is so uh believe in that and other than that as uh, you know all of our speakers said today especially sayed babar ali saab that uh values are very much needed and i have been and i said it in my speech as well at uh, in the lum speech as well that we need to go ahead with values uh, whether it's the values of truth honesty uh, these are the messages of islam these are the messages of our culture these are the messages of our civilization and it's important that we also institutionalize these ethics and values we are lacking it and when these values are lacking it's so easy then for things like corruption dishonesty to to happen and to continue uh, and just as lums has taken these initiatives and other institutions are taking these initiatives that they are promoting welfare inclusivity equality when you institutionalize these ethics then it is then it becomes part of the system and then everyone has to adopt and accept it and go on with it so it's important that we bring values within ourselves but also externally in the system that we live in Lala Yusuf Zai, Dr. Maliya Khan, Syed Babrali, and Dr. Ashad Ahmed. It has been a privilege. It has been an honor. And as Faiz Saab said, halka kiye baithe roho, is shama ko yaro, kuch roshni baaki to hai, har chand ke kam hai. Aap sab ke vakt ka, aap sab ki baaton ka bein taha shukriya. Please look after yourself. And those of us, those of you who are watching, please stay safe and please stay indoors. Apna bahut bahut khayal rakhein. Once again, thank you so much and khuda hafiz.